morning. Happy Friday. Welcome to, yes, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to this meeting of the UW System Board of Regents. Glad to have you with us today. Megan, please call the roll. Regent President Walsh. Here. Regent Vice President Boga. Here. Regent Adams. Present. Regent Atwell. Here. Regent Brankus. Here. Regent Colon. Here. Regent Jones. Here. Regent Cruiser. Present. Regent Many Deeds. Here. Regent Miller. Here. Regent Peterson. Here. Regent Prince. Present. Regent Rye. Here. Regent Staten. Here. Thank you. Regent Tyler. Here. Regent Underley. Regent Fox. Here. Regent Weatherly. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any board members who wish to declare conflicts of interest regarding today's open session agenda? I will kick it off. Uh, to avoid appearance of conflict of interest, I'm recusing myself from discussion and voting on capital planning and budget item H, the UWEC Science Health Sci Building, and CPP item one, the hospital expansion. Anyone else? Yes, Regent Jones. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. Also, in order to avoid the appearance of conflict of interest, I will recuse myself from debating or voting on the capital planning budget agenda item I. Thank you. Regent Rye. Also, to avoid the appearance of any conflict, I'll also be uh, not voting or debating uh, business and finance item I. Thank you. Regent Weatherly. Uh, for the exact same reasons, I will not be participating or voting on item E. Okay. Regent Bogus. Yes, to avoid even the appearance of a conflict, I will recuse myself from um, CPP item I. Okay, very good. Thank you, everyone. Um, please recuse yourself from discussion or voting as you've indicated. Now I will call upon Regent Weatherly to present the report of the Education Committee. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. Yesterday, the Education Committee approved four degree programs, a board appointment, and the strategic plan for the Wisconsin Partnership Program, and discussed strategies to improve student retention. We approved UW-Green Bay's Education Doctorate and Applied Leadership, which will prepare graduates for leadership positions in uh, K through 12, higher education, nonprofit, health organizations, government agencies, and private companies. UW Lacrosse Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science, addressing existing and future environmental issues is a fundamental outcome of this program that builds an established relationship within the private and public sectors, providing potential internship opportunities for students. UW Milwaukee Bachelor of Arts in General Letters to help students complete their degree with significant number of upper division credits so students develop expertise and accumulate a portfolio of experience and the option to complete minor certificates and micro credentials within that degree. UW Parkside Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology, elevating an existing concentration in geography where Greg, no new resources. The major provides a full anthropology degree covering all the subfields of biology, archeology, span linguistics, and cultural anthropology. We also approve the appointment of, of Dr. Um, Aduya, to the Oversight and Advisory Committee of the Wisconsin Partnership Program. The Wisconsin Partnership Program's five-year strategic plan and discuss their annual report with Dr. Amy Kind. Amy Kind is here as well today, I believe. Thank you again for your presentation. Finally, we discuss strategies to increase student retention led by presenters from UW Stevens Point, Milwaukee and Parkside, provost, student affair officers and current students share their key student retention success programs to support academic progression and persistence from admission through graduation. After sharing the overall landscape, presenters provided examples of programs like Stevens Point's Lead Bridge, undergraduate research at Milwaukee, and work-based learning programs at UW Parkside. Region President, this concludes my report. Therefore, I move for adoption by the board, resolutions C1 through C6 and D2. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any questions or discussion for the Education Committee? Seeing none, all those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the resolution is passed. Now Regent Walks will present the report of the Capital Planning and Budget Committee. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. Uh, the Capital Planning and Budget Committee met yesterday to consider seven items. We started the meeting by approving 11 projects, including on the consent agenda, uh, one instructional space project at Parkside, six all agency projects at Eau Claire, Stevens Point, Milwaukee, and Madison, and four minor facility renewal projects 
at Platteville, Madison, and Superior. The committee reviewed and approved a request to increase the amount of leased laboratory space located at Element Labs by approximately 13,600 square feet on behalf of UW-Madison to accommodate the AIDS Viral Research Laboratory located in another space at, at the University Research Park. In April 2021, this board approved the lease renewal for the AIDS Viral Research Laboratory for almost 19,000 square feet of BSL-2 and BSL-3 space at their current location in the research park. At the time, the proposed tenant improvements of this facility would upgrade a portion of the space from BSL-2 to BSL-3 research space. Unfortunately, though the design process, uh, it, through the design process, it was determined the current location cannot achieve higher research protocols because of the age and construction of the facility. Relocation of the lab and seven associated principal investigators to the Element Lab facility will increase the existing lease to almost 65,000 square feet. The new lab will increase respiratory viral research capabilities along with research funding estimated at 2.5 million to 4 million per year. Once the lab is relocated, the existing lease with an annual expense of approximately $600,000 will be terminated. Next, the committee approved the request to construct the Champions Hall addition and renovation project for an estimated total cost of $32,900,000 on behalf of UW Stevens Point. This project constructs a, a new two-story 53,000 square feet student health and wellness center addition to Champions Hall. Situated in the southwest corner of the facility, the new footprint demolishes parking lot F West and a small one-story storage building. New accessible parking and one-story storage area, area will be constructed on the north side. Minor interior renovations to the existing facility for connecting circulation and infrastructure will be necessary. The building design achieves campus and DFD goals for sustainability and includes electric, electrical vehicle charging station infrastructure, native landscaping, dark sky compliant exterior lighting, high performance bird friendly glazing, solar driven automatic shades and a PV uh, array ready roof area. To encourage student interaction and reflect on the university's healthy communities initiative, a new fitness space for cardio training and weights will be provided. The center will also include space for student health services, counseling services and testing services. Project work includes demolition of two buildings no longer needed and beyond their intended use, Desel Hall and Park Student Services Center at a future date. On behalf of UW-Stout, the committee considered and approved the request to construct a Heritage Hall addition and renovation project for an estimated total cost of $138,887,000 of segregated revenue. This project creates a new unified home for the College of Arts and Human Sciences within Heritage Hall by consolidating and co-locating spaces currently spread across several facilities. It will provide greater space efficiencies, utilization and opportunity for collaboration and informal learning, and will create a unified, fully accessible disability services suite for program and student counseling centers. All interior floor layouts will be reconfigured for the new program occupancy and adjacency requirements. All building infrastructure, mechanical, electrical, telecommunication, plumbing systems will be replaced. Fully renovating Heritage Hall will also modernize the CAHS instructional spaces by, by emulating real world working environments, creating new customizable and flexible program spaces that promote collabor collaboration and, and informal learning techniques and replacing outdated educational facilities with techni technologically rich spaces configured and sized for the proposed activities that take place within them. <clears throat> Upon the occupancy of Heritage Hall, this project will include abatement and demolition, demolition of the 1954 wing of the Vocational Rehabilitation Building. Next, the committee approved a request to construct the Science Health Science Building Phases 1 and 2 in the lower campus chiller and cooling tower replacement projects for an estimated 
total cost of $342,405,200 at UW Eau Claire. The Science Health, the Science Health Science Building Project constructs a new home for the biology, computer science, geography, anthropo anthropology, and geological programs, and includes space for the cycle for the psychology and watershed programs. The new instructional spaces will be designed and modeled to, for flexibility to adequately serve multiple courses, disciplines, and programs. The exterior envelope building entrances, entrances and mechanical system equipment and controls will be designed for optimal energy efficiency and sustainability. The lower campus chiller and cooling tower replacement projects replaces an existing 650, 650 ton centrifugal chiller and new nominal 1000 a ton chiller that services the lower campus. All necessary piping, controls, electrical, and other related components will be replaced as well. The new chiller and controls will be connected to and integrated with the existing 1,400 ton chiller and controls to work in parallel. The current primary science facility, Phillips Hall, will be raised and the site will be redeveloped partially to expand parking and the remainder will re be restored back to green space. Following that, the committee considered a request to allow expansion of UW hospitals and clinics on Board of Regent property. The land underneath the hospital is owned by the Board of Regents. The proposed hospital uh, D2 module expansion has been envisioned since 2005 and was included in the 2015 UW Madison Campus Master Plan. It is part of a long-term growth strategy to accommodate and modernize the University Hospital Clinical Science Center. It will be added, it will add approximately 101,000, uh, about 101,500 GSF in a location that is currently open space and loading dock area. This project will be delivered under the University of Wisconsin Hospital Clinics Authority as granted in Wisconsin statutes and is subject to approval from the Board of Regents prior to being submitted to the Department of Administration for approval. The committee approved the request. Next, the committee considered a request by UW-Madison to increase the budget of the Near East Playfields renovation project to accept bids received on November 30 by $2,118,255 for a total estimated project cost of $12,118,255 in gift and grants funds. This project was originally approved with a total budget of $10 million. Due to constrained market conditions, the figure is higher than anticipated. The university wishes to proceed with the project and has identified funds to cover the shortfall. The community committee approved the request. Senior Associate Vice President Alex Roll provided a status report on leasing activity between June 1, 2023 and November, 2023. <laughs> Three new leases were executed. 12 leases were either amended, renewed, or terminated. She concluded the meeting <clears throat> with an update of the capital budget process. <clears throat> Madam President, that concludes my report. I move resolutions D1, D2, D3, F, G, and J. Thank you. Is there a second to this? Any questions or discussion? Right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And that resolution passes. I move resolution E. Second? Second. Any questions or discussions on E? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Madam President, I, I move resolution H. Okay. Great. We've got a real, um, <laughs> we got a machine over here. Thank you. Any questions or discussions on item H? Thank you. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. One Madam more. President, I move res resolution I. Second. <laughs> See how Thank well you. trained we are. Okay, <laughs> guys are amazing. Um, so any questions or discussions on item I? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. And we are passed. Very good. Thank you, Regent Walks. 
Oh my gosh. I now call upon Regent Miller to present the report from the Audit Committee. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. The Audit Committee met yesterday morning. Chief Aud Audit Executive Lori Starts reviewed the progress to date on the fiscal year 2024 audit plan. She confirmed that her office is making solid progress on the plan and expects to bring more audit reports to the committee when we meet in February 2024. Ms. Stortz then provided a high-level summary of the results of audits recently issued by the Office of Internal Audit since our last meeting in October 2023. This included the Information Technology Asset Management, the Madison NCAA Compliance for Fiscal Year 2023, and the Nepotism and Conflicts of Interest Audits. Next, Paige Smith, Chief Compliance and Risk Officer, UW Administration, introduced Joshua Moon, Director of UW Green Bay Athletics, who presented the UW Green Bay Annual Athletics Report to the committee. And lastly, Julie Gordon, Senior Associate Vice President for Finance, UW Administration, presented the General Ledger Clearing Account Update. The Regents acknowledged the significant work and progress made by management to reduce the number of General Ledger Clearing Account audits. It was a great improvement. We, we greatly appreciate her efforts and the, the efforts of the campuses. The Regents thank the participants for their ongoing support, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Miller. And now, finally, Regent Rye for the report on the Business and Finance Committee. Thank you, Regent President Walsh. The Business and Finance Committee acted on its agenda as follows. Item D, UW System Draft 2023 Annual Financial Report. First, the committee reviewed the draft uh, UW Annual Financial Report for 2023 prepared by the Office of Finance. The report notes that the UW System's total net position as of June 30th stood at $6.4 billion dollars a decrease of $56.3 million from the prior year. The main factors contributing to this change includes, uh, include transfers to the Intermediate Term Cash Management Fund, an increase in the total value of capital assets, and a decrease in the value of pension plan investments managed by the Department of Employee Trust Funds. While operating revenues increased nearly 7%, expenses increased by 16.5%. Although nearly half of the increases in expenses relates to non-cash adjustments and retirement benefit programs, this imbalance underscores the importance of the budget management practices undertaken by the campuses in alignment with our strategic plan. Item E, UW Institutional Service Agreements for International Recruitment. Next, the committee approved five agreements for International Recruitment Agent Aggregator Services. UW's Eau Claire, Green Bay, Platteville, and Superior will work with Shortlight LLC, while UW Stout will engage King's Education in efforts to increase international student enrollment. These agreements follow the board's approval in November of similar agreements with two other universities that are utilizing this approach that was conceived as part of a multi-campus internationalization plan. Item F, approval of University Insurance Association, UIA, board restructuring. The committee then approved a recommendation related to the University Insurance Association, a separate corp established in the 1930s to provide life insurance benefits. The proposal transfers ownership of the UIA plan to the Board of Regents as advised by General Counsel based on a 1994 Wisconsin Attorney General opinion. In addition, it, authorize, it authorizes the termination of the UIA plan at the end of calendar year 2024, dependent on establishing a special enrollment period for active employees and a conversion period for retirees. Active employees will have the option to enroll in other plans, including state group life insurance, which offers employer contributions and is considered the highest value program for UW employees. Item G, the committee then received the annual report on faculty turnover, which provides a summary of faculty departures attributed to retirement, resignation, and non-renewed contracts. The 330 faculty who left the UW in fiscal year 23 represents 6.1% of all faculty, a slight increase from the 5.4% mark in fiscal year 22. Of those departures, 50%, 57% retired and 41% resigned. Item H, intermediate, cash uh, intermediate term cash management fund approval of investment policy statement. Next, the committee approved the investment policy statement for the intermediate cash Intermediate Term Cash Management Fund, which was established to increase revenue generating opportunities for cash balances through intermediate term investments. The statement outlines the investment objectives, asset allocations, and the roles and duties of those responsible for management of the fund in accordance with Regent Policy Document 3118, which is approved by the board in November. 
Next, item I, Intermediate Term Fund Quarterly Investment Report. Next, the Office of Trust Funds shared the Q3 report of the same intermediate term fund. As of September 30th, fund assets totaled $645 million. For the quarter, the ITF decreased in value 0.9%, slightly lagging its benchmark by 0.1%. Item J, Trust Funds Quarterly Investment Report. Lastly, the committee received the Q3 report on the Trust Funds Assets managed by the State of Wisconsin Investment Board. As of September 30th, those assets totaled $560 million. For the quarter, the long-term fund decreased in value 2.56%, slightly outperforming its benchmark, while the income cap fund gained 1.33% for the period. In conclusion, on behalf of the Business and Finance Committee, I now move approval of resolutions E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, F and H. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, any questions or discussions uh, regarding these items? Seeing none, we'll vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The resolution is passed. <clears throat> now we're going to get an update and overview of EAB Navigate Student Success Management System and its three main components which include a faculty and staff platform, a student app, and analytics. As President Rothman noted yesterday, supporting student success is built into not only our mission, but also our strategic plan, and Navigate plays a significant role with its network of timely and high-touch support. To kick things off this morning, we'll have a brief presentations from Dr. Julie Amen, Associate Vice President for Enrollment and Student Success, and Dr. Ben Passmore, Associate Vice President for Policy Analysis and Research. We'll follow that with a presentation and discussion with student success professionals and several student representatives from our universities, UW Parkside, UW Stevens Point, and UW Whitewater. Dr. Amen, good morning, and the floor is yours. Good morning. Go ahead and get the slides up, please. Great, thank you. So good morning, Regent President Walsh, Regents and colleagues today. I'm very pleased to spend time with these colleagues here at the table this morning talking about our investment in and use of EAB Navigate to support student success. There we go. Um, retention and completion. So when we talk about um, EAB Navigate, um, throughout all of our universities of Wisconsin, our missions, visions, values, and strategic plans, we are focused on and committed to success of our students. In support of this commitment in 2019, with your support, we made our largest investment in student success with a multi-year investment in the EAB Navigate Student Success Management System. And as you'll hear this morning, that investment is paying dividends and improving student engagement, success, and retention. Navigate is a technology and data-driven tool designed to move the needle on student success and retention. It's used at 12 of our universities and hundreds of higher education institutions across the country. Throughout its use, it has demonstrated its value by improving retention and student success, helping close equity achievement gaps, improving, providing support in limited resource environments. Further, Navigate users at the universities of Wisconsin form a community of practice, sharing best practices and lesson learns not only with each other, but also with more than 800 other institutions across the country. Navigate provides coordinated communication, integrated support, and thoughtful interventions at each stage of the student life cycle. It unites administrators, faculty, staff, and students in a collaborative network that supports the entire student experience. And it allows staff and faculty to provide proactive and holistic guidance and support. As I mentioned, our commitment to student learning and success runs deep at all of the universities of Wisconsin. And as such, the use of Navigate very much aligns with and supports our strategic plans, our goals, our priorities, and a variety of student success initiatives throughout our universities. There are three components of the EAB Navigate system. First of all, you have strategic care, which is used by staff and faculty who can access student information to identify specific students. They can reach out and support students and seamlessly coordinate care to help students navigate their academic careers. 
The next is the smart guidance aspect of the platform used by students. The student app can be accessed on their phones or desktop computer, and it provides them with access to helpful resources and proactive guidance at critical times throughout each semester. This feature allows staff to strategically share information with students based on the specific time of the semester, um, a variety of topics, and then specific student needs and interests. Finally, there's the intelligence feature used by administrators and staff. Throughout the use of predictive analytics, we're able to identify factors that are putting our students at risk and to develop targeted and effective interventions. The integrated use of these three components allows us to connect students with resources, critical information, and support um, to promote their engagement, student set success, and retention. Certainly, you're going to hear about how Navigate is being used to support student success on several of our campuses. However, I'd like to share some high-level um, examples of how it actually works. For faculty staff, Navigate is integrated into the workflow and for academic advisors, but it's not just an advising tool. Rather, it's used by many units across each university. It's helped our universities think holistically about the issue of student success. It's helped them spend less time on routine tasks and more time directly engaging with their students. Navigate is an especially valuable tool during the pandemic, and it was used to identify and connect students who are struggling to provide resources and supports supports. However, it continues to be that vital tool. It also provides a lot of actionable student data. It provides reporting and analytics tool, allowing us to make data-driven decisions about how to support our students. It can raise alerts on students or share progress reports. It can conduct outreach campaigns, for example, to students who might be on probation or to encourage them to, to register for classes. It also provides coordinated care. It provides a way for staff and faculty to communicate across campus with notes or referrals, and it ensures that the university shares responsibility for student care. And directly for our students, it also puts a lot of information right at their fingertips. It empowers our students to take charge of their own success. It provides pivotal guidance to help students stay on track. Students can reach out if they need help and they don't know where to turn. They can act, learn information about how to access campus resources such as telehealth. They can easily access their account information to um, work on their schedule or figure out what kind of holds might preventing them to um, register for classes, for example. They can also use to-do lists and kind of get reminders about what are the important things that they need to do to stay on track, um, to uh, take care of tasks to get on track for graduation. However, it's important to realize as you listen and learn today about how we're using EAB that while it's a fabulous uh, tool and a piece of technology, it's really the people that are using EAB Navigate on each of our campuses um, that really make it shine and really help our students to achieve the learning and success um, that we all hope that they achieve. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben, who's gonna talk more specifically about the kinds of impacts that we've actually seen in our five years of using Navigate. Thank y'all. Always happy to be in front of the board. And uh, we have, uh, uh, let, me, let me go back in time a little bit just to kind of get where we started with some of this. It was recognized early on by campuses and in fact by the board that we faced a set of challenges that we needed some help with. That the, the number of students participating, we've heard this many times in this, in this group, the number of students participating straight out of high school was in decline. But more importantly, in some ways, is the students we were getting had a different set of needs than the students we got a generation ago. And our ability to effectively intervene, and particularly in resource-constrained times, was in decline. And then lastly, even when we addressed those needs, even when we were there with the students, there was a general recognition that although we have a, as I was talking to the Education Committee about yesterday, a very respectable uh, retention rate, there was room to improve. That we wanted to make sure as many students who came to us as is possible succeeded and ended up with the degrees that they had sought. Um, there was along the uh, there was early on interest from the advising community in this. We used this. This is a fine example of all of the pieces working well together. The advising community specifically brought this to our attention. We were able to consolidate a series of contracts. There were UWs out there using this system already. And we were able to pull these together 
into a single contract achieve, achieve significant cost savings and expand this to be able to be used by uh, others. We also were able to use system support to ensure that as uh, campuses were using this, that they were able to use this in the most effective fashion. Learning from what other campuses had done, a perfect example of the kind of systemness that we always talk about and, and that we check are often challenged to, to uh, see uh, in action. So what we ended up with was a common platform that allows for proactive advising, the kind of shared student experience, all the things that uh, Dr. Amon was, was addressing. <clears throat> this um, process, like everything in the last five years, <clears throat> has been one that was very much impacted by the uh, COVID pandemic. We, uh, the, the board approved this contract in, I believe, December of 2018. The first meetings of campuses generally were in early 2019, and we managed to have all of this up and running the first week in March of 2020, which is an incredibly significant date because we then plunged into um, uh, the acute phase of the pandemic. And it was, in fact, something that allowed us to reach out to students at a moment when, when our kind of our traditional methods of doing so had essentially gone away. It is like Zoom, and which I guess we're on at the moment. A great example of a technology that had gotten to a point that it was really particularly effective at the moment that we really needed it. Over the last uh, several, over the last few years, up until this year, we had developed this, piloted with various groups. Various groups tried on campuses, mostly the advising community, tried to do ver tried various approaches with this. They were successful, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the that success in a moment, but. When this year, we, we got to the point where we had to renew or we had to look to renew the contract. And it was requested by the board that we come and talk a little bit about where this has been and where this is going. And I think that what we're going to hear about today is from the campuses a little bit of both. That in fact, that the potential that we are already, that we've already, the, the results we've already achieved are nothing compared to the potential that's ahead of us in the use of this. So, one of the things that I think um, I, I, I'm generally in front of this board to talk about results and talk about numbers. And one of the things that uh, Navigate allows us to do, and it makes it particularly something I enjoy, is it allows us to track in detail the relative success of groups of students with, who have had different interventions. I always use the, uh, the analogy of uh, treatment of illness. No, you would never want a doctor who just throws a thing of medicine in your general direction and says, take some of that, it'll probably make you better. What we want to know is how much and precisely what. And that's the real potential for Navigate in terms of our understanding whether or not we are succeeding with some of the interventions uh, we've done. Uh, just to track whether or not we've succeeded at kind of a general level, we'll talk about specific campus uh, sort of success in a bit. But in fall of 2020, and remember, this is already after we've seen an enormous boost in utilization and only a year into the, or less than a year into the use of the product, we already had nearly 60% of our students. This has grown to three quarters of our students who are utilizing uh, this for the most basic uh, sorts of things. And two thirds of our students are actually in there as student users actively uh, engaging with the, uh, the interface. Similarly, we, one, of the, one of the next big steps forward is going to be bringing more faculty members in, really making this the kind of, uh, it, it's important with faculty members, and we see this with our uh, digital learning environment, for this to be easy, for this to be the thing that they don't have to spend time trying to learn a new technology. This is really, we're, we're getting there with this. And as we can see, in fall of 2020, we had less than half. Now we're up to nearly 60% of faculty who are in fact participating at some level with, uh, with the product. And I believe this is specifically with a progress report campaign, which actually does require them to reach out and do some active work where they use this in order to determine whether the student is doing uh, well. But all of that is just utilization. Let me talk a little bit about what it has done in terms of outcomes. We, um, overall, those who were engaged, that is to say, those who were essentially touched by uh, use of the Navigate system, 
uh, were retained at substantially higher rates than those who were not, who didn't engage with this. Now, some might argue there's some degree of self-selection here. Nonetheless, this is one of those communications tools that once you are in fact going back and forth, it is so effective that folks are, are that, that it has an immediate and uh, substantial effect. And it's not just holding on to them. The, I, I actually, I never quite know how to display this. The DFW rate, that's the, the rate at which students end up with a, a D, an F, or a withdrawal during a course of a year. What we see is those who engaged in this, only about a third of them ended up with any of those bad grades, as it were, whereas over half of those who did not engage ended up with them. And this is maybe my favorite piece of this, which is I, I spoke yesterday about the fact that we have good retention and graduation rates in front of the education committee, but was at pains to point out that we also have persistent performance gaps that students who are from all the groups that we're concerned with, first generation, low income, underrepresented minority, tend to perform less well. With uh, Navigate, what we've seen is success that is even greater for those groups than it is for, um, for the, the kind of traditional student. And that is largely because they are, these students are receiving attention specifically to them, to them, not fired broadly at a group, but actual outreach that, that connects them. We see that the, the, in both of this, retention rate is better, the, that spread is better, as is the, the uh, DFW rate for these first generation students. And it's not just for these students, it's for, uh, and this is uh, retention rate. This is, it is for students who started off with cumulative GPA below 3.0, it's for underrepresented minorities. And that last one bears some, some attention. Mm -hmm. This high support profile, one of the things that, that Navigate allows us to do is, through a combination of factors and some advanced analysis, we're able to pick out which students we most need to reach out to, who could use this support in the, uh, most effectively. And if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the numbers there, and it's did not attend, and I've got to get, this is an intervention campaign from fall of 22. If you look at that, the kind of retention of the students with uh, that high support profile, who did not attend is, is, is really worrisome. I mean, it's less than 30%, less than one in three students who, who return. And we're able to get that up to 54% uh, through the, the kind of intervention here. Sometimes we get criticized. People say, you're self-selecting these students. They're, they're only the students who would have done this anyway. This is not the case here. This is students who need the outreach. We know need the outreach and who receive this kind of uh, attention. But all of that, as excited as I get, and I'm kind of realized I'm working up to being kind of excited here as I, I speak, <laughs> is, is really kind of at the very general level. It doesn't, it doesn't tell the story that, that we want to tell because most of the story that we want to tell has to do with the kind of tailored outreach programs that are going on, our ability, again, to measure the effectiveness of it, and, and frankly, um, uh, the, the impact it has directly on individual students. So... All that said, I want to go ahead and hand it over to our university uh, representatives who are here. And I'm going to remember to pass the clicker this time and uh, say thank you. And please introduce yourselves. For, yeah. Good morning, everybody. I am Deanne Posell, the Assistant Provost for Student Success at UW Parkside. Um, do you want us to introduce ourselves this way or just do it as we present? You can do it as you present. Okay. How about that? Perfect. So as a part of our academic planning process, several years ago, we established a student success goal to increase our six-year graduation rate to 50% by 2025. And several years after that, we, we added the additional goal of closing equity gaps by 2030. And we've been working on that in a number of different ways, through credit accrual strategies, through advising supports, through math and English completion, and obviously through the use of our Navigate tool. And so this slide sort of shows you our results to date. Um, the gray dotted line shows our historical six-year graduation rate, and it shows the progress we've been making over time. But it also shows that we have a ways to go in terms of closing the equity gap. And Navigate is an important tool as a part of that process, but we also decided it, that we needed some additional support in that area. So UW Parkside, along with my colleagues from UWM, 
became part of the first region in this country that joined the Moonshot for Equity, which is a national initiative that aims to close equity gaps. And so that initiative focuses on really um, expanding the use of technology and helping campuses think about what it means to be equity minded um, from the campus perspective, but also a series of either starting or scaling a series of best practices. Many of these you might recognize, but I do wanna talk about a couple of them because I think they're kind of interesting. Um, so one of them is hold reform. So very simply uh, as a part of this, they asked us to audit our holds. And there's a couple things that we found as a part of that process. We had a lot of holds in our student information system that stopped students from registering. And when we looked at who was impacted, you might be able to guess it was most likely our students of color. And so we made some changes there. So we've drastically reduced the amount of holds that hold uh, registration. We also looked at our debt threshold that prevents registration. And relatively recently, we raised to 1500 as your debt threshold. So you can register for classes. And what we found there was that the students that did return continued to be registered or graduated and also they did not maintain debt with the institution, they paid it off. So basically what it showed us is that students, particularly low income students needed a longer runway than is traditionally provided in our academic structures to be able to uh, pay off their debt and register for classes. We also focused on a retention grant. That grant um, is focused on trying to find students who are running out of aid, uh, but are very close to graduating because we saw that many students came very, very close, but they had to stop out because they owed us money. And the other thing I just wanna spotlight before I go into holistic and coordinated care is we intentionally started to engage students that had stopped out. We work with a company called ReUp and it reaches out to students that have been out of our institution for at least a year. And to date, 300 students have returned to our campus and some of those students have actually graduated. And so we're really excited about that particular initiative. But I wanna focus on holistic and coordinated care and the use of Navigate. So um, as a part of our EAB maturity curve that we, we decided to scale two practices, monitoring student concerns and differentiating care. And so in monitoring students' concerns, we've been using the academic progress report. Um, and that particular report we can get information when you do that, you can send out, you can ask for uh, information about a particular student, a group of students, or you even can target it to classes, particular classes you're concerned about. So we've been doing it in terms of, uh, we use targeted classes to, when we started this work. And so this is just a little bit of a snapshot of, of our targeted class academic progress report, which shows, which actually supports what Ben was talking about, that students where a case was recreated, the faculty member told us that they had a C minus or less in the class, and they interacted with one of our staff members, they were retained at higher levels than those students who did not. And so we decided that really thinking about early alert as a success strategy was really important. And we decided it was time to scale that. And so as a campus this fall, we have actually, um, we actually use a lot of different mechanisms to get information about students. We use the academic progress report, but we also use a feature which is an ad hoc report where any person on the campus, faculty or staff member can report at any time during the semester when they have a concern about a student. We also use quick polls, which is a feature in the app where they open up the app and ask them a couple questions. And this poll is focused on basically sort of a, how are you doing? And if they tell us they're not doing well, we create a case and a staff member reaches out. And then we also opened a new feature started this fall that is in the, Na the Navigate app, which is hand raised, where students can raise the alert on themselves and a staff person will reach out. We also moved away from classes to thinking more about targeted populations. And we are focusing on new freshmen and new transfers, freshmen on probation and athletes, and added additional alert options where cases can be created. And I think the thing what we're trying to do is the early data shows us that if somebody tells us there's an issue, and a staff member reaches out, it can have an impact. And that is our goal. So the other thing I wanna talk about related to this is it's important to sure, ensure that every student gets a consistent response. And so when a case is created, we have identified on our campus who will do the outreach to that student, but also what our expectations are in terms of what that outreach will look like and the timing. And we monitor that to ensure that that's happening on campus. 
The other area we're focusing on is coordinated outreach and differentiated care. So we've developed a week by week calendar. It's built on the concept of nudging, which is getting students the information they need right when they need it. And also targeting it to particular students on your campus because not everybody needs everything. And it's a collaboration currently with six departments. It does have targeted communication and we use all the, the communication tools that are available in Navigate. And we will be expanding this moving forward in the future. But the thing I wanna talk about um, is we had the good fortune of having, um, getting a Title III grant that focuses on success coaching for new freshmen and new transfers. And so it was a perfect opportunity to think about the concept of differentiated care. And so we use the analytics that are in um, Navigate that identifies a support index for a student. And so we've developed different in interventions based on that support index. And so students in the high and moderate support areas receive additional touch points by our success coaches throughout the academic year. And in our first year, the initial results are positive. The retention is about the same. The average GPA is about the same. There's a slight difference in the amount of credits by term that are achieved by the students in the moderate and high support. But what that does is it shows the institution we have an opportunity to think about how we might support that student differently to increase their credit accrual. So I wanna emphasize that Navigate has been incredibly important in our student success journey and in the work that we've been able to do. Um, our first to second year retention rate has returned to pre-pandemic rates. And to be honest, we were very, very worried about that considering the population we serve. Our first to third and first to fourth year retention rates are the highest in our history. You saw earlier that we were able to make some really good progress on six year graduation rates. And now we're focusing on four year graduation rates, which are also the highest in our history right now. And we've seen some upward tick for Pell students and Hispanic students. And so we're excited about the progress we've made. We know we have a lot of work to do, but Navigate has been an incredibly important um, technology for us to have, to be able to accomplish the things that we want, want to accomplish for our students. And so now I wanna turn it over to Michael from UW-Whitewater to talk about their stories. Thank you, Deanne. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Lango. I am from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater and I currently serve as our Director of Academic Advising. Uh, Navigate has been a tremendous tool on our campus, uh, vital to our efforts around increasing retention and graduation for our students. One of the significant ways we've used Navigate is our creation of a differentiated care model for first year students, which you've heard some of this morning. This slide shows you uh, what a landing page in Navigate looks like for advisors when they pull up information on their student. So Abby, who's with us today and has given me permission to show you what her page <laughs> looks like. Um, as you can see, you've heard us talk about the retention support indicator. And so the first thing that an advisor sees right there on the screen is what level of support might a student need? So that retention model utilizes data points, including student placement scores, demographics, zip code, GPA, and more to assign that support level to each student. And this indicates to the advisor if the student may need a low, medium, or high level of support in order to be retained. Utilizing this uh, retention predictor data, our university has developed a differentiated care model, which allows advisors to prioritize those students who may need a higher level of support. In front of you, you see our differentiated care calendar. So before the semester begins, advisors can focus on contacting students who may need a lower level of support to introduce themselves. This allows us to meet virtually with students discuss their enrollment, review placement scores and AP or dual credits, and then help students understand how their advisor will support their success throughout the semester. Once the semester begins, advisors reach out to our students who are predicted to have a high or medium level of support and schedule in-person meetings with those students to develop a strong relationship, outlining the interaction they will have throughout the semester and the allyship they can experience from their advisors. To be clear, all students can meet in-person with their advisors, but by prioritizing our high and medium students, we position ourselves as advocates for their success from the beginning of the semester. This support continues throughout the semester as we prioritize students through progress reports and academic alerts the advisor to receive for their students. Our differentiated care model allows us to actively respond to progress reports we receive for our students. This chart shows that when an advisor receives a progress report for a student, either that they are doing well or that they may need some support, those students who are reflected in the two purple columns you see have a much higher persistence and retention rate. Navigate provides that platform to distribute progress reports for advisors to do outreach, for us to assign to-do items to students, such as to go to tutoring or reach out to mental health support, 
to email campus resources to our students, and to send notes of congratulations and encouragement when there's no concern about their academic performance. Longitudinally, this is making a difference. The data supports the students who are identified as needing support and who respond or engage in our interventions have an 11% higher persistence rate over time. Those interventions would not be possible without a development of a coordinated care network across campus, engaging with Navigate to support our student success. I'll hand things off to Jessica Stein, Assistant Director of Academic Advising and Exploration, to talk about the network that she has championed on our campus. Thank you, Michael. As Michael mentioned, Navigate has been very vital for part of providing wraparound support to our students. And we use what we call a coordinated care network. Um, that's EAB language. But basically, it's a group of individuals that is providing support and wraparound care to students. On Whitewater's campus, we have onboarded, we are in the process of our last one, of 14 different units. And this really allows us to identify where students have relationships and leverage those relationships to get them the help they need. Me telling a student to do something versus their football coach telling them to do something lands very different. So we've really been strategic about seeing who we can get into the system to provide that care and ultimately get the student to participate in our intervention. The platform also allows us to customize each unit to make sure that they have access to information that they should have access to, that they need access to, but also the features that would be helpful to them in performing the interventions that will help students. One of the examples of how we use this coordinated care is through the Warhawk check-in survey. This is a survey that we launched through Navigate during week three of the semester for new students for two years. So each semester that they're on campus, they get this survey. It's very simple, but it really hits on issues or concerns that are common for students to experience. Sense of belonging, financial planning, academic um, uh, understanding. So what we do is we ask some simple questions they can answer those questions. And the platform allows us to then automatically give them resources that will be helpful to them based on how they answer that question. If they say they're having trouble with their academics, tutoring pops up, their academic advisor pops up. So that is automatically programmed in and has taken a lot of load off of the work that we had to do manually. It also allows for personal follow-up. So if a student says that they are not feeling like they are creating friends on campus, they're not feeling like they belong on campus, we can have a peer mentor or RA or some other peer reach out to them through the platform. They get notified through an alert that they can go in and help the student. So we use this coordinated care to identify what is the concern, what resources are, resources are there, and what individuals are on campus that can help them. We're also excited to showcase two different ways that we're using the platform. EAB have been great about expanding different features that we can use to help students. So two different options that we have implemented or in the process of implementing are HandRaise and Career Ascend. HandRaise is a new feature that we launched this semester. Students can go into their Navigate app and actually ask for help now. We have four different uh, reasons that they can select. Those are very common reasons that students don't persist. Mental health and wellness concerns, academic concerns, um, sense of belonging. They can go in and say, I would like resources about this topic. This is a very non-intrusive way for them to get help. They get emailed a list of resources that they can then review and reach out as they feel uh, comfortable. They also have the option through the app to say, I'm just having a question and I would really like somebody to help me. And one of our staff members reach out to see how we can assist. We've also been asked by EAB to be part of the initial cohort to launch Career Ascent. This is going to help students make informed decisions about their post-graduation and internship plans. What happens is students can get connected to companies that match their interests and qualifications, and companies will be able to see students who are qualified for the different opportunities that they have. So we're going to be launching that in the next year, and we're really excited to see how that happens. I'm going to pass it over to Abby Reiser, our amazing student on campus. Hello, everyone. I'm Abby Reiser, Director of Academic Affairs for Whitewater Student Government. So although I use Navigate primarily for academic advising, it's really a one-stop shop for many resources on campus worth highlighting. So last year, I was working on a sociology research paper, and I noticed in Navigate, there was the option to schedule an appointment with a sociology research librarian. Now, this ultimately saved both me and the librarian time because we didn't have to email back and forth. I didn't have to find her on the website. I just went into Navigate, found when we were both available, and I ultimately put it on our schedule. Another feature on Navigate that's really helpful was the opportunity to schedule an appointment with the 
career advisor. So I'm a marketing and management major. So I scheduled an appointment with our business advisor and we talked about careers in the workplace for marketing and management. Along those lines, there's a major explorer survey. And that survey is really cool because it has you in input your goals, your interests, and then it accumulates majors that align with those interests. So since I indicated that I'm interested in business as well as the social sciences, it accumulated majors like marketing management as well as sociology and psychology. Now from there, you can look at careers within a specific major. So I pressed on marketing and I noticed that there's a marketing manager. And so I wanted to find more information about that. So then I pressed farther and I found that the marketing manager, um, it put information like what the years of experience those employers are looking for and the years of education and also top skills like persuasion and neg negotiation are really key for marketing. And so ultimately, Navigate is really beneficial for students because it's where all the resources are really accessible and it's simple. And so ultimately it enhances student success due to the availability of those resources. And so with that, I will pass it off to Gretel. Thank you very much. I am Gretel Stock, Dean of University College at UW Stevens Point, which is our student support and success college. I would have been joined by Kaylin Schaefer, who's one of our students, but he had a last minute uh, end of semester conflict. So I'll be representing uh, his comments today. Our, my colleagues from Whitewater and Parkside have talked very eloquently about many of the interventions that our UW system colleagues uh, work together on uh, through Navigate. And uh, Dr. Passmore and Eamon have talked about the big picture and how that has imp impacted universities across the system. I'd like to take the big picture down to the university level and talk a little bit about how Navigate uh, fits into the overall student success ecosystem that we have at UW Stevens Point. I'm gonna take just a brief minute to describe what you're looking at here. Uh, I, when I talk to our colleagues about how they can impact retention at the university, I remind them that we are all part of a broader ecosystem of coordinated care, of support that we've intentionally designed for our students at the university. Those supports, we know across the top, the things that drive uh, connection and dr drive retention are the connections to the university, which we call pointer connections, whether they're academically progressing, how their mental and physical health is, and their finances. We have a series of supports that are listed, I'll describe momentarily, that create the ecosystem in which students can thrive and be successful, and then a framework for how we can take action through supporting academic success, belonging, connection, major and career readiness, and personal development for students. Foundational supports at the university uh, include things like our orientation, our welcome win pointers week, our advising model that supports students through their first three semesters with professional advisors, our curriculum, our tutoring learning center, and others. Then we have engagement supports across the university where there are faculty who play critical roles, departments who are set specifically to support engagement, student government, experiential learning opportunities. These are crucial parts of our universities that support student success. We also have special interest groups and populations such as athletes, specific programs, the LEAD program in which the education committee heard about yesterday, our international students, they are supported in specific and unique ways that are slightly different because of their differentiated needs. And we also make sure that the students wellness and crisis supports are available because we know the wheels fall off at some point and the students need various levels of support in order to help their mental health, their physical health, their basic needs or their career and professional needs. Finally, we want to make sure that students complete at the university. Faculty and departments play a crucial role in connecting academic skills to their career outcomes. Our retention services offices make sure that we are supporting students as they, retention, as they retain and complete and continue to register. And then there are capstone and career experiences and last mile funding. This is the water in which we swim at the university. This, these kinds of supports are built around our students intentionally so that we can help them succeed in their careers and in their education. So how does this relate to Navigate? Navigate empowers the ecosystem, very simply put. Without a tool like Navigate, parts of our ecosystem are disconnected, they're less coordinated, and they don't work as well together or as holistically in order to support student success. So Navigate has given us the opportunity to hit several of these sort of empowerment points. One is it's optimized conversations. 
an advisor, a faculty member, a person in the TLC, a student in the, a person working in the financial aid office can open up a student profile, see who they've talked to, get a quick view of that student's information, but also dig in deeper and find out more about that student's story. This keeps the student from having to repeat their story to a new person, which is a lot of emotional load on that student, but also it makes it uh, possible for us to communicate together about what's going on with our crucial students' lives. It also streamlines communications in that communications can go out to multiple students at one time instead of having to be a, a one at a time or a bulk email. And they're also differentiated per need. We have campaigns, for example, where students are prompted to register. As soon as that student registers, they drop off the campaign. We don't have to mark them automatically. We don't have to take them off. It just happens so that we're able to focus our time on that more intensive outreach that students might need. It prioritizes sharing information. So by default, we can control who sees what information in the system and prioritizes information being available to a wide variety of users who uh, might have to dig for that information in a variety of university systems otherwise. So much like the students having the information on their app in one place, the staff can also have information on the students they're serving in one place. It also provides student nudging, as some of our colleagues talked about this morning, to prompt them at those key moments of need. It maximizes the resources we have at the institution, we use them for best effect, and also provides us data in order to discover more about our students that we wouldn't have access to before. We've had some very uh, powerful outcomes at Stevens Point, just like some of my colleagues. Uh, we have had uh, increased success metrics for students who have appointments. So students with appointments had 26% point lower DFW rate and a 28% higher retention rate than those who did not engage with us. That's a pretty significant difference. First generation students had a 32% lower DFW rate and a 22% higher uh, retention rate. So much uh, like we were speaking about earlier, our students who are in challenging situations or have backgrounds that are not, uh, they're not familiar with college life, they are doing better when they're engaging with us in appointment campaigns and navigate. We also have a uh, seamless follow-up and referral. We've all had the experience where we talk to a student and say, here's the next office you should talk to. Let's, let's get into financial aid because you really need to talk about your finances. Odds are that follow-up never happens because the student then has to go and talk to somebody else. And we know that help-seeking behavior, especially right now post-COVID, is at an all-time low for our students. They're really trying to do it on their own or they're not sure where to reach out for help. In Navigate, an advisor or someone in another situation can sit down with a student appointment themselves right there for the student. They can show them how to do it in the app or they can make it for the student. Then the student gets a text message follow-up when they're supposed to show up and gets reminders. That has a huge impact on the amount of appointments that students have uh, participated in. Our rate of students no-showing has dropped precipitously on campus since we've implemented Navigate for a variety of these student tools. Navigate also supports uh, a framework for action. So there's a lot of information we have where we wonder or we're not able to take uh, steps to ameliorate a concern that we see. Navigate gives us that immediate tool to say, I can identify this group of students and I can take action. I can reach out, I can address resources to them, I can provide them that support. So it puts us in a frame of enabling that ecosystem to work as opposed to making people say, well, we know these students need help, but I don't know how to connect with them in the most effective way. Finally, it's, it's shaped our retention strategy with data. Navigate's uh, analytics capability is what I call a curiosity tool. So we use our Office of Institutional Research and Effectiveness data and OPAR data as our official markers of the institution. But Navigate allows you to explore that data in ways that is not possible with some of that information. So analytics data lets you look at real-time data on the fly in a dashboard-like format and gives us trends that we can then take action on. So for example, we noticed that student finances was one of the primary reasons why students weren't persisting at the institution. We've been able to take action in what areas and in what majors and in what programs, so we know what sorts of information, what sorts of pots of money at the institution we can use to help those students persist and proceed. Finally, I'd like to share some of uh, Kylan's comments. Uh, Kylan is a, a peer advisor in our Academic and Career Advising Center and also is our student manager of our STEM drop-in center for the Tutoring Learning Center. Um, he has just a few things on his plate at the moment, which is probably why he's not here today. Um, one of the things that Kylan really appreciates using as a tool in Navigate in the Navigate app is a tool called Study Buddies. 
where he can look at and ask for study buddies in any class that he's in and anyone else who's interested in forming a study group can also put their information in there and they'll automatically connect the students. Takes away that first sort of awkward, hey, did you wanna study for this exam kind of question? And I know our current set of students want to avoid awkwardness at all costs. <laughs> There's also a My Docs feature within the app where Kylan and others can go and look at the notes that the advisor shared with them. So there's no wondering, did I remember that correctly? Did I have the notes that I took? It's right there in the app that the advisor's notes are there and available and any documents that they uploaded, the student can access. He also likes using it for the first week of class because he can quick pull up his schedule. It shows you what building your classes are in. It can even give you directions to that building if you're not sure how to get there. But it's a quick way to take a look at the schedule before you've built your full schedule uh, out in your own personal planning tool. And Kylan also likes text reminders because it gives them a nice nudge. On the student support side of where Kylan works as a peer advisor, they use the data in Navigate on the, their appointments specifically in the TLC weekly to analyze patterns. They in fact recently made a decision about staffing for the drop-in center that Kylan manages because no one was coming between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m. consistently over the full semester. And so they decided to shorten those hours and ended up getting more people coming in during their regular the drop-in hours that they offered but we have that access to that information immediately as opposed to collating multiple spreadsheets and making that information uh, more available. Um, Kylan really talks about how um, their next step is going to be soliciting student feedback through exit surveys from the TLC, their tutoring learning center. So again, it lets us close that loop and make sure that we're offering quality services uh, to the students uh, who need it. I'm now going to turn it back over to Vice President Eamon for uh, additional, excuse me, Associate Vice President Eamon for additional information. Thank you. So I have to I have to say, as someone who started as a grad assistant academic advisor about a million years ago, I could listen to these stories all day long. And I also wish I had this tool when I was when I started as an advisor, because um, this is these are this is a game changing tool in terms of how we engage and support our students. So thank you so much for sharing your stories and sharing your experience. Y'all are doing phenomenal work. I'm so excited and proud. And, and this is just a really um, great way to spend a morning, in my opinion. Um, so um, I hope that regions, I hope that you're all left with understanding the power and potential and real impact that navigate um, has on our students and our universities. I also want to acknowledge that there's great work happening at all of our universities that are using Navigate. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we had an EAB um, Navigate Senior Leaders Summit, and we heard um, similar stories from Eau Claire, Green Bay, Superior, and Milwaukee um, about their lessons learned and best practices. Um, and also, you all received a handout looks like this that kind of also highlights some of those stories from all of our universities. Um, as you also heard, our, our universities um, all participate in the community of practice on campuses with faculty and staff, um, and we think we expect they're going to continue to learn and grow together as we figure out how to, as Ben said, maximize the potential that is this tool. And you actually heard a couple of examples this morning about some of the new features that EAB has been adding that just allow us to go further with our support and engagement with our students. So we're committed to maximizing the functionality of this technology to support our faculty and staff as they support our students. I wanna thank you on behalf of everybody here at the table today for your continued support of EAB Navigate. We hope that you see that it truly has been and we believe it will continue to be a very wise investment in the support and success of our students. And at this point, we'll turn it over to you for any questions or comments. Thank you very much. It's always exciting when a piece of software meets expectations. <laughs> and if you can get a bargain price by bundling, I mean, I got pretty excited by that, actually. Um, any questions or comments from Regents? Yes, Regent Ryan. Yeah, and, and number one, thank you. I know this kind of came out of, as a request out of committee when we approved the contract to present to the whole board. So thank you, Regent President, for getting it on the agenda. And thank you all for presenting. Um, it seems... It, it, the implementation is different campus by campus by campus. And I can understand that uh, and everybody's doing it at a different time, but is there like a basic structure expectation? This is more a question for Ben on the implementation or a ramp up implementation on making sure we're using the whole product across the system. 
you know, I think the best way to, to think about this is think about the difference in the institutions. So there was, yes, there's a baseline expectation that we'd have it up and running. And actually our target was uh, back in March of 2019, that it be up and running in basic features. The first place it was used with was with our professional advisors. But even that, um, our University of Wisconsin River Falls has a different advising model. So what this is, has been a, a technology that is flexible enough to kind of meet with the business practices that are going on on the campus and adapt the technology to those business practices rather than having that technology tail wag the dog as occasionally happens. So there has been that. And now each of the institutions has a, a specific service plan that they are using to kind of drive forward next steps. And in a lot of instances, what we had was someone will jump ahead on one thing, but then we'll use the community of practice to kind of lessons learned They'll improve their process, but then we'll also kind of expand the use in that area out. So this is, um, so, so yes, there was a basic expectation that we'd stand it up and use it. It was targeted a specific care area to begin with. Uh, we've used kind of a, a let the leaders lead sort of model for what to do next. Um, but we've, we've monitored that through these service plans to make sure that in fact, we are continuing to make progress. And as you can hear, I heard like four or five things that I didn't even know it could do. So, which was yeah, surprising. That's, 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 that's it, that so. happens a lot. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Can I comment on that a little bit? Um, this last year, one of the things that happened system-wide was, and I alluded to it, was the maturity curve piece. And I think that rubric helps us get at what you're talking about. We may not do it all the same, but there are some benchmarks that we're all striving for that are common across. Um, as we look at um, how we go about each of the parts and the elements of the tool and be able to utilize it in the most efficient and effective way. And that I think has been really, like I would say, because I've been here from the beginning, is that's been, that piece was really effective to help us really think about, you know, how do we go now the next, st take this next step farther. So my follow-up question to that is it was thank you, number one, to our student for being here and giving us the student perspective because that's very important to us. But engagement on this app is a two-way street and advising perspective was great today. Student perspective, all was awesome. Faculty perspective, we didn't really hear today. Uh, and you know what is the expectation of engagement of faculty? Is there one that's set through shared governance? Uh, and the utilization of it, because it seems like the product's only going to be as good as the two-way street here when it comes to the direct faculty to student engagement. I, I, I'm assuming advisors are highly engaged in it since you're presenting here today. So that's the component that I felt was kind of missing and would love to hear a perspective. I think, so I'm, I'm happy to go in and add on how we've approached that at, at Stephen's point. Uh, we often find faculty adopt technology when it, it meets a need of theirs. And so in our most successful departments, we have a fair number of faculty advisors who are actively using both the appointment campaigns where a student will make advising appointments with them. They're taking notes and then they're reaching out to their students. The departments where they're finding uh, they're very engaged with the student experiences around um, clinicals, for example, or key benchmarks in their programs, those faculty have jumped on faster uh, but the expectation of that we're setting out through training and through discussions is that faculty put their calendar, connect their calendar, or at least make availability during advising season for students to log in and utilize that and utilize it as the official advising record. So any notes about the student has to be in there about their advising journey. That in combination with our new four-year planning tool is going to really, is really transforming the conversations that faculty are having with their students. I'll also add that at UW-Whitewater, we also recognize how are we engaging with our faculty peers. And so uh, we relaunched Navigate this year, recognizing that maybe March of 20 wasn't the best time to have a lot of new technology. So we relaunched. Um, and what we've seen is a 3% a increase in the number of faculty who are engaging. And as you know, faculty like data, right? So we've been able to go and show them that when you submit a progress report, either that the student is doing well or not doing well, that increases their, their success, right? And so being able to do that has made um, a big impact on our campus. And uh, I really appreciate Dr. Passmore's comment because it's an analogy that I use with our faculty. You would not go to your doctor and 
have your doctor say like, have you ever had blood pressure issues? What's your medical history like, right? You expect that they go in and they have a comprehensive view of your history and how they can support you to be um, successful. And that's what this does for our faculty, for our um, uh, advisors on campus to be able to look back and see, oh, the student has had multiple progress reports in the areas of math, right? So I need to be aware of that when I'm having that conversation with them about um, heavy math majors that might not be where you're headed, right? Or let's talk about how you can get there through the support that we offer on campus. So I think that, um, that's that been really instrumental for us to engage our faculty more and we're seeing that response already this semester. I think building off of, of what you said and then also what Ben said, it really is very much at the university level. Um, back at the Navigate um, Summit a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Eau Claire and Superior who are doing some really interesting things in terms of increasing faculty engagement, but it is very much about the the culture of that campus and the way that we're engaging with our faculty. and But making the case with data was certainly one of the things that kind of um, came up as some of those conversations and also making it as easy and seamless um, for faculty to engage with. We don't wanna add on extra work. We wanna let this be the tool that is where they do their work. And so that's one of the areas I think when we talk about you know our maturity curve and growing, it's growing and deepening that relationship with our faculty because they're on the front lines. They're seeing the students or not seeing the students right in their classes. And so that's that's a third critical partner um, in the in maximizing the effectiveness of this tool. Region focused. Uh, I just I want to say thank you. That that was extremely informative, and it's amazing the high impact this has had, and the data speaks for itself. But I was just curious, and I wasn't sure if it was Julie that that said it in the beginning. Um, I think you called it rev up, getting students back in um, to the universities. And I, I'm sorry, oh, me. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Dan. Um, I was just wondering if you could explain that. How how if they're gone, how do you reach them? <laughs> Well, that's why we have a partner because that is a challenge, to be honest. We um, actually tried to do this ourselves and found it very difficult to find the students after they had been out for a while or to provide. And we also didn't have the staffing to be able to provide the kind of supports that students needed to be able to sort of deal with some of the things that might have led to them stopping out. And so there is a company called Reup that uses some analytics tools and other things that I don't really know um, to find uh, the students that have stopped out from us. Um, and we send them a file with the most recent information we have, and they use their magic to work that list. And then they have a coach and they coach that student back to the institution, but they do more than that. They also stay with them as a coach until they complete. Because a lot of times after a student has stopped out, they may stop out again. Um, and so they stay with, they build a relationship and stay with them. And so we're a small campus. We didn't have the resources to be able to do that. And so that's why we let, went in this direction, but we've been really pleased with it. So is there something in the agreement with REUP that says we're going to stay and coach you yep. to stay at the institution you're at? Yes. What if I'm a student who might need to move to another institution? So they will help a student with that, but their incentive is based on the students that return to UW Parkside. Okay, so there's a there's a funding base model. cost and then there's a premium. There's a funding model that's based on them returning to our campus. I see. Okay, so. Could we use them to uh, recruit students from other institutions? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I think uh, I, th I think actually Regent Adams brought up yesterday in business and finance in the context of a discussion about recruiting international students. Is there anything that we can do to work with third parties to identify uh, students in underrepresented groups who we could more actively recruit through third parties? So. I thought that was an interesting question. It's interesting to hear that you're doing that. Yeah, and particularly, you know, we lost a lot of students due to COVID, right? A lot right. of students stopped out and did not return. So sort of is, other institutions. Yes, and so this has really been incredibly helpful for us. I think that what I really love about this is it's an application of technology that has a heavy personal component because mm -hmm. I think a lot of these students, a lot of young people, a lot of all people are very lonely and they have plenty of machine time, and the machine connects in this case to an actual person. 
which uh, I think is stunning. I appreciate that several of you mentioned the possibility that the better outcomes correlate with self-selection. But I would say, isn't that exactly what we want, is to call forth self-selection? So uh, I just think it's a great, great story. Keep it up. Maybe there's other things we can do. Other questions are coming. Yeah, Regent Jones. What is, what is the thinking behind why one in four of our students approximately don't engage with Navigate? Is it just that it seems it just is too complicated or they don't need it? Or what is their mm. think, general thinking about that? I think one of the things that we've seen at UW Whitewater is in our first year advising office, engaging with Navigate is the only way that you are going to get an appointment with an advisor, right? Mm -hmm. You have to log into the platform. You have to schedule that way. We just make it easier. So I think for us at Whitewater, our students who are at junior or senior level standing may not have engaged with the platform the way that our current freshmen and sophomores have. So we're right. seeing our growth grow over the years yeah. as it's becoming more prevalent on campus. And so from day one at orientation, we put up the QR code and we tell them download this app because this is how things are going to happen. So I think mm -hmm. that student utilization will continue to grow over time because it's becoming more commonplace. And what we're hearing from our students as well is that they're now looking at their faculty who might not be in Navigate and saying, mm -hmm. I'm trying to find you and I can't find you in my app. Mm -hmm. Right. And faculty are calling Jessica going, okay, I need to set up Navigate. Can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Regent Weatherly. Uh, yeah, I have a comment and a question. Um, first, I'd really like to highlight one of our extraordinary leaders um, at the University of Wisconsin. Is I had some questions about Navigate about six months ago. Um, and afterwards, Provost Chenoweth came up to me and said, uh, Kyle, it sounds like you had some questions. Do you want to come down to Whitewater and actually see it in action? And him and his team spent um, three hours with me, walking me through Navigate, um, seeing what it's like. And, and I can tell you firsthand, well, from spending three hours with it and then walk through it is incredibly powerful software. Um, I will also say from what I saw, we are not fully utilizing all the features. That is a known thing. That's not like, I'm not surprised. We all know there's a long way to go with, with Navigate. Um, but I, I just want to highlight uh, uh, John for going out of his way and making, not only seeing that I had questions and I was curious, but also making so much time available for us. Um, but then now I have a pointed question, uh, which is, Often with technology, it's, you know, to see the, the bells and whistles is very impressive. And you can point to anecdotal examples of mm -hmm. this treated group versus the other group. But just yesterday, our education committee, we looked at two-year retention, right? And it has remained flat yep. for the last 10 years. So, and that's what we're trying to push, along with a bunch of other metrics, right? But when you look across the entire student population, we are remaining flat, despite what we see is we have these new powerful tools and we can present evidence that they have an impact. So, and again, I don't, I'm not going anywhere with this question, but as you as professionals, how do we reconcile that? Is it be patient? This needs to be fully implemented. What's your advice, at least to me? So one of the perspectives that uh, I would share is um, at least in the last six years, had we not had Navigate, I think those numbers wouldn't be flat those numbers would be down. Yeah. We are seeing our sibling institutions across the country struggling with retention rates because of massive mental health concerns among students, massive financial concerns, especially first generation and underrepresented students and Pell eligible students. Uh, we are retaining more students because we're using a coordinated approach uh, through Navigate. We're just not seeing the drop that many of our colleagues are. Um, I also think that it's, it's partially um, making, now that we can identify who the students are that aren't engaging, we can lean in harder on those students. And I think that's the differentiated care that you heard across the table today that all of us are engaging in. We can now identify who needs the work more. We know it's the very engaged and excited and uh, happy student who comes in and wants to talk to their advisor, and wants to take advantage of every single opportunity that the college has to offer. Now we know the students that aren't engaging in those opportunities and we can go ahead and make sure that they're getting a personal touch uh, to be encouraged because all it takes is one touch from anyone, an advisor, a tutor, a residence hall person, financial aid counselor, a custodian, someone who sees that student and gets them the right connection. That's where Navigate helps us do that at scale. And that's where we're leaning into next now that we're more fully implemented. 
So I would comment two things on that. One is that a, a technology tool only helps you think about how you can do the work. You still have to work with the team and have them think about that they need to do their work differently. And like a cultural change that is happening around some of the work that we do is we typically as universities, if we try to treat everyone the same, and it's sort of the spray and spray model of, of, of student success. And this is getting people to think differently. Like it is okay that I am like in that differentiated care model, providing more support to this particular group of students and less support to these other students who will make it with just a little bit of support from us compared to those that need more of our time. It becomes, it's a cultural shift in how we do our work. I also think along with the tool, the institutions, and I can name my own, have to think about some of our institutional practices that maybe create other barriers that a technology tool will not solve. And I think I alluded to a couple of them in my moonshot portion of this is like looking at things that we're, you know, like our practices related to registration holds, our debt thresholds, our um, institutional practices on um, payment plans. There's all sorts of opportunities for us to think more deeply about how we can support students with the things that like, for example, finances is not gonna be a technology tool is not necessarily gonna solve that challenge for a low income student. And so how can we do those things and start to change some of our institutional practices that align with where we're trying to get? And those are like, we're doing the technology piece, we're changing some culture and how we do business. We also have to look at some of our institutional practices. Thank you very much. We're going to stop here and uh, I will send you off with a tremendous thank you. Um, it's exciting to hear about a piece of technology that's really gonna help with one of our strategic plan items. Keep up the good work. Thank you again for coming. We're gonna take a 15 minute break here. We'll see you back here at 10.30. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda will turn our attention to sustainability efforts at our UW universities, where we are and where we're going. For those of you who've been with us a while, you may recall that this board hosted a very engaging discussion on sustainability in April 2022. Today's presentation and discussion will build on that. We'll start with updates from Capital Planning and Budget's new sustainability coordinators on their work and what's being done to make our campuses more sustainable. These efforts include sustainable building standards, renewable energy projects, long-term energy planning, data collection, experiential education opportunities, and more. Then we're very pleased to have a student panel with representatives from seven of our universities to provide firsthand accounts of how strong campus commitment to sustainability can contribute to student mental health and enrollment decisions. Vice President Nelson, would you start us off? Yes, thank you, Regent President Walsh. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a follow-up uh, from our April uh, 2022 meeting uh, out at Stevens Point, where we had all the students present before the board. Um, one of the follow-ups was really a request from the board to report back on our progress around our sustainability efforts. And I think in that time since, we've made a lot of progress. So you'll hear a lot more about that in a moment. Um, but I want to mention just two things that have ha also happened in the interim. Obviously, the board approved our strategic plan, uh, which, of course, included a goal to ensure that our universities were environmentally sustainable uh, to help them fulfill their mission. And then second, we actually hired uh, two sustainability coordinators at System. I'm very pleased they've hit the ground running, made so much progress in advancing our sustainability goals for the UW, and I'm really excited to hear from them in a moment. So without further ado, let me introduce Hayden Henderson and Liz Davey. Hello, Hayden, take it away. Um, thank you, board members, for this opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Hayden Henderson, and I'm one of two sustainability coordinators in the Office of Capital Planning and Budget, along with Liz Davey here with me today. Um, we understand you were given a presentation on sustainability across the universities last April, and we want to update you once again on work 
being done by us and around our campuses to improve sustainability or our ability to meet our needs with our planet's resources now and into the future. So Liz and I will start off and then we're gonna hand it over to our nine student presenters who have traveled from around the state right before their finals to talk with you all here today um, because they want to let us know that they demand sustainability from us. Um, and we also have other sustainability coordinators and um, students interested in sustainability that have traveled from there on this, around the state in the audience with us today as well. Um, we have an incredible network of sustainability across the system. Um, so to give you an idea of what that looks like in terms of staffing, we have a sustainability coordinator or designated staff person in one case um, at all of the 13 main four-year campuses although we won't be fully staffed for long as layoffs affect our colleagues. Um, long before Liz and I were here, these sustainability coordinators have done really an amazing job of setting up ways to connect with each other. For example, all UW sustainability staff get together on Zoom once a month, and then once a year, all get together in person at an annual meeting hosted by one of the schools. This past year was hosted by UW La Crosse and had nearly 100 student, staff, faculty, and state representatives present. And the meeting was an extraordinary showcase of information and melding of our greatest minds about pressing topics like reducing our energy footprint. UW Stout will host next year at the end of October. Of course, you are all invited. <laughs> All the staff are part of one or multiple working groups that also meet monthly and foster continual collaboration. And those working groups are highlighted in the side graphic on the screen. Robust work comes out of these groups like research into EV charging practices around our campuses um, and example standards. Our procurement group, for example, examines how our contracts and purchases could better meet certain standards, such as with potential policy changes. Um, and as you can tell by having students here today, our students are a major reason we have this robust work being done in sustainability across the universities. They ask for it, they ask for it to be taught in the curriculum, and they expect our campuses to be sustainable. Just to remind you all, all of our work connects back to the 2023 to 2028 strategic plan. So strategy S5 of the strategic plan sets forth the expectations of our universities being sustainable in all senses of the word. We see our roles as helping to fulfill that mission. And one of the roles that allows us to meet this expectation of sustainability is looking at how sustainable our built environment is and can be. So the plan measures success in that area by incorporating sustainability and resiliency measures into our capital projects. So Liz is going to touch on our work in that area next. As a first step, we updated the sustainable design principles that are included in Regents Policy Document 1915 uh, you, the Board of Regents, approved these updates in June. These principles address emerging issues and best practices in sustainable design, and they provide sustainability goals informed by the needs of higher education. To help every major project achieve these goals, we've drafted specific sustainable building standards and targets. We've shared the draft standards with the Division of Facilities Development for comments, and we'll be sending them soon to the universities for review. Next. Oh, uh, a number of solar installations of significant size are coming online. These include large ground-mounted solar arrays on university land, rooftop solar on campus buildings, utility purchases, and utility projects on leased UW land. The university-owned projects are funded through the State Energy Saving Performance Contracting Program. The bonds funding these projects will be paid back through the savings of the electricity they, provide, they generate. The university-owned projects that begin operating this year will be eligible for tax credits made available through the Inflation Reduction Act. They give us an opportunity to apply for these new tax credits in the first year 
recovering a portion of the project costs and giving us experience with these new clean energy incentives. Another aspect of our work is collecting energy and emission data. So my goal is to be able to report our total greenhouse gas emissions for every campus in one online dashboard. The basic categories I'm collecting data for and will report on are shown on the screen. And through gathering this data, I'm working on methods to improve our access to it um, going forward, as right now, much of this data sits deep inside thousands of handwritten invoices. Um, overall, my purpose is to know what we can improve and have metrics for improvement. Um, we can't effectively prioritize and affect change if we don't know our impacts and what needs to change. So hopefully one of the next times I speak with you, I'll be showing you our impact dashboard. One of our greatest sustainability challenges is planning for the future of the systems that heat and cool our university buildings. This year, UW-Eau Claire took a significant step with a long-term utility planning study that included evaluating alternatives to the existing thermal systems. The team considered multiple realistic heating and cooling options for campus, including business as usual, geothermal conversion, and bundles of different technologies that balance cost effectiveness with reducing carbon emissions. And the image on the slide shows both, like it's, it's a, a detail of the plan from um, the North Campus, and it shows both the existing steam lines and then potential location for a geothermal well field. The study was also notable because the team evaluated the carbon impact of each alternative, along with the life cycle dollar costs. This fall, UW-Madison began a parallel utility and energy study, documenting options for decarbonizing campus utility infrastructure. These two studies provide examples of the kinds of energy planning processes that will be needed at each university in the future, though the approaches and solutions identified will be different for each one. Um, overall, as you can see from our focus on solar data, long-term energy planning, a major goal of ours is to help come up with plans to manage our energy. Um, we'll help connect campuses to energy efficiency funding to enable those upgrades and overall conserve our energy. In addition to conservation, we can help think of how to switch energy sources to more renewable ones while managing our energy costs. Um, we have a variety of options to purchase renewable energy, which can even be a hedge against rising prices. Um, by moving to more and more renewable energy, we avoid the costs of carbon, both its climate impact and potential direct financial costs in the future. One indicator of the high caliber of sustainable work, sustainability work at the University of Wisconsin, the Universities of Wisconsin, is the U.S. Department of Education's Green Ribbon Schools Award. This award recognizes schools and universities that have reduced their environmental impact, and it also considers related efforts to support the health and well-being of students and employees, and providing environmental and sustainability education that includes civic learning, green career pathways, and STEM. The UW Platteville was honored this year, most recent of a number of UW institutions uh, that have earned this recognition. Um, as important as it is to operate in more sustainable ways, university sustainability efforts have the added responsibility and the added benefit of supporting teaching, research, and learning at our institutions. Our sustainability programs, offices, and coordinators support active, experiential, solutions-oriented learning in academic classes and in co-curricular activities. They provide opportunities to use the campus itself as a laboratory, a site and subject of research and learning in emerging fields and practices. Um, I hope you have gleaned that we're all here to help set the Universities of Wisconsin apart 
as a world leader in sustainability research, teaching, and practices. So we hope to have your support in our work. Now we have nine student presenters from seven different campuses to tell you how they contribute to this impressive array of sustainability projects happening in our state. Many have chosen to come to the universities of Wisconsin because of the opportunities to study and practice sustainability, and they'll talk to you about those enrollment decisions. Um, or many of our students enroll and find we could improve in sustainability and are very sure to let us know. And many find that student well being and mental health is directly linked to the state of sustainability in our world and on our campuses. So they'll also talk to you about that connection. Our food choices have a huge environmental impact. Um, you'll notice a thread about food insecurity woven throughout their presentations. And many of these students work to improve access to food on our campuses, helping to quite literally sustain our students. I'll let each student introduce themselves as they talk. And you should have a copy of all of their impressive roles that these students have, so they don't have to list them all, um, many of which are paid jobs and elected positions. Um, so I'll have each student talk one right after another for three minutes each. And then at the end, we'll open it up to discussion and questions. Um, thank you all so much for being here today and take it away, Bergen. Hello everyone, my name is Bergen Hag and I'm a sophomore at the University of Wisconsin Stout pursuing a degree in industrial design. Additionally, I serve as the sustainability director for the Stout Student Association, also known as Stout Senate. This year, I'm actively involved in shirk government's committees such as Waste Reduction Work Group, Sustainability Steering Committee, and I serve as the Transportation Liaison with Dunn County Transit, ensuring smooth operations of stout shuttle buses on campus and in the city of Menominee. As the Director of Sustainability, I'm continually learning about government and policy. It's an honor that fellow students approach me with concerns about stout's carbon footprint. I bring these concerns to my council, collaborating with local officials and university administration to devise effective solutions. Admittedly, holding a leadership role can be stressful, but I enjoy the challenges it brings. Balancing work and school is crucial, and as a busy student dealing with various mental health issues, including generalized anxiety and panic attack disorder, maintaining this balance is even more critical. Despite my mental health challenges, I don't let my anxiety hinder my efforts to make positive change on campus. Fortunately, I've had the support I need, and I've learned coping mechanisms, including openly talking about mental health and finding strategies that work best for me. However, I recognize that not all students have access to similar resources or support. As someone dealing with mental health, I've observed how sustainability issues on campus contribute to this toll. Students worry about their future amid the climate crisis, leading to long-term risks of mental illness as highlighted by the World Health Organization. This manifests in various forms such as depression, anxiety, grief, stress, and even suicidal behaviors. Unfortunately, universities often overlook the stigma of mental health and lack the necessary support nor do universities address the sustainable issues contribute to this distress. We as students do everything in our power to create a safe environment when it is already in shambles. Although a solution may not be available at present, it is imperative to acknowledge the problem and take appropriate measures. As we continue to discuss this issue, it is important to recognize the significance of addressing these challenges for the well-being of the Wisconsin community. Many people are unaware of the climate crisis affecting the mental well-being of students. And we are responsible for our future and it is in danger. I appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me speak today. Thank you. And I pass it on to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Melina Wynn. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an undergraduate junior here at UW-Madison. I serve as an intern with the UW-Madison Office of Sustainability, and I also work as the finance director for the People's Farm UW. I'm honored to be here today to talk about the intersection of food insecurity and environmental sustainability, especially as a way to both attract and support students to the universities of Wisconsin. I first wanna start by talking about how food fits into sustainability generally and talking about how energy is wasted in food production. According to the EPA, 52% of US land is used for agriculture, whether that be for livestock or crop production. And yet the USDA estimates that 30 to 40% of the US food supply goes wasted, which means that the resources, water, inputs, and energy that we're putting into that food production is also being wasted. 
The food justice movement looks at restructuring our food systems to both promote sustainable, sustainable resource management and reduce food insecurity, as these are two goals that can be achieved in the same vein. Food insecurity is defined as the state or condition of not having reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food to meet one's basic dietary needs. This can look like eating smaller portions or skipping meals, or even not having access to fresh, affordable produce nearby, which is true for a lot of college students. There's an incredible amount of student work that's been done at UW-Madison to address food insecurity. And today I'll be highlighting the work of just four student organizations that have to do with both sustainability and food insecurity. The first is the Open Seat Food Pantry. And this food pantry has worked to distribute 6,500 pounds of food last fall semesters to students for free. The second is Slow Food UW, which serves two meals per week to students, one being pay what you can and the other being affordably priced at five to eight dollars, serving a total of two to three thousand students, faculty, staff and community members over the course of a semester. Next is the People's Farm, which is an organic community garden that this growing season produced 4,500 pounds of vegetables given to students for free. And finally, Food Recovery Network, which is an organization that works to redistribute food from campus partners into two free meals for students each week, taking food that would otherwise be wasted and putting that into basic needs resources for students. Students rely heavily on these thousands of meals and thousands of pounds of food, and the demand for these resources is only growing. In a 2022 study by the National Institutes of Health, it was found that more than one third of college students are food insecure nationwide. And this is an issue that especially affects racial and ethnic minorities, former foster youth and first generation college students. College students simply cannot succeed when we're hungry and student work and food security, many of the organizations that I previously highlighted is largely unpaid. This crisis is only made worse by the affordable housing crisis in Madison, where students are paying more and more for rent and have less money to go towards food resources. As a first generation Asian American student, I can say that I've relied heavily upon these resources during my time in college, and they are what has allowed me to succeed, and this is true of many of my friends as well. In order to keep bringing students to universities of Wisconsin, it's vital that we invest in student health and student well being, and this has to do with basic resources such as food. Therefore, I'm calling on the universities of Wisconsin to consider both the impact of food insecurity on student retention and mental health, and also increase institutional support for student work being done to promote food justice. Thank you. Hello, this might be over three minutes by a little bit, but I'll talk fast. Hi, my name is Christina. I am a senior at UW-Madison, and I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. It's truly such a privilege. Um, I'm a senior, like I said, I'm studying environmental sciences, political science, sustainability, and public policy, so quite a mouthful. I also have the honor of serving as the sustainability chair for the Associated Students of Madison, as well as the co-president for the Madison chapter of the Food Recovery Network. I'm here today not just to tell you that students care about sustainability, but to show you what it looks like as a student who cares about sustainability. That being said, I can also not sit here today in good faith as a representative of my student government and not bring forth the concerns of my fellow students regarding recent challenges to the continuation of our diversity, equity, and inclusion programming. I understand that many of you sitting here today do not support cutting DEI programs at our universities. And I want to thank you for the work that you are doing. Please continue to fight the pressures that call on you to divest from the health, well-being, success of all students within the universities of Wisconsin. That being said, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I conducted this survey, those questions up there, um, and I wanted to provide a couple of the data points that I found. If you would like any of the quotes from students, I provided an opportunity for them to elaborate, and I'm happy to provide more information on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so out of the 713 respondents, 22% responded that the sustainability initiatives, operations, and opportunities available at their current university impacted their enrollment decision. 30% responded that their mental health is negatively affected by their university's lack of action to address the climate crisis. Among respondents who responded no or not affected or unsure other, out of those who chose to elaborate, a majority commented that they were not even aware of their university's efforts in sustainability in the first place. I can speak for myself when I say that sustainability offerings did impact my choice to come here over at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is where I'm from. 
um, even despite their more robust financial aid offer. As a student who was paying for my own education, it was a significant investment for me to prioritize my future and choose a university that also prioritizes my future. It is truly humbling to sit here today along such passionate leaders in sustainability. Every day I'm inspired by my peers who devote endless hours to pushing sustainability initiatives at all of the universities of Wisconsin. But I want to convey what this passion looks like behind the scenes. It looks like skipping classes to attend meetings with administrators. It looks like missing countless assignment deadlines, checking your three organization email accounts first thing in the morning, but being too overwhelmed to actually answer anything. It looks like missing out on social opportunities, game days, events that you should feel privileged to even have the chance to attend in your limited time at your university. It looks like constantly feeling as though you are doing so much work, but knowing that there's always more to be done and little to show for your efforts. Being a student leader in sustainability is exhausting. I'm exhausted, but I'm grateful for the relationships that my leadership team and I have been able to cultivate with our university's administration who demonstrate a commitment to sustainability and continually invite students into their conversations about future sustainability initiatives on our campus specifically. These relationships are just simply not enough. We have been told over and over and over that students are driving sustainability efforts on campuses, and it's incredibly gratifying to see those impacts. Yet sustainability student spaces cultivate a culture of rapid burnout when our university and the system as a whole lack adequate support for these efforts. We need to invest more resources in sustainability and environmental justice focused positions at the administrative level if we want to make any significant process in addressing our institution's impacts on climate change. These investments will likely drive emissions and retention rates up in, fut in a future where a majority of young people care about addressing the climate crisis. I urge you to listen to the students who feel like they are often screaming at a concrete wall about how much they care about sustainability. Please prioritize investments in sustainability initiatives because these investments are also investments in the health, well being, success, and future of your current, past, and future students. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. Pass it along. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nina Harwig. I am a graduate student at UWM and I'm getting my master's in freshwater science. And I am also the freshwater or the water stewardship intern for UWM's Office of Sustainability. I chose UWM because the fact that sustainability is interwoven into my educational opportunities. In my undergraduate, getting my conservation and environmental science degree, I was able to get hands-on opportunities in sustainability off the, off the ground level. I was also able to get opportunities experiencing hands-on consulting work in sustainability fields during my freshwater master's program. In my undergraduate program, I was able to develop a pond management plan for a local organization, and we were able, as students, to incorporate our own sustainability goals and practices for long-term environmental health in our area. In graduate school, I worked on an offshore wind feasibility project for my city of Milwaukee, focusing on increasing green energy and work towards Milwaukee city and equity goals. My work at the Office of Sustainability has been long. I have been there for nearly four years at this point in time, and I have worked on a variety of different things there. First and foremost, I've been working in the gardens and the composting operations for a while. I have been able to produce food for our food pantry on campus. During 2020, during the pandemic, we transitioned all of our garden beds on campus to produce food for the food pantry instead of being sold to our cafe. So far, we have been able to donate uh, upwards of 800 pounds of produce to our campus food pantry. And recently, I was able to secure two hydroponic systems seen on the slide right there to be able to grow food all year round for our food pantry. Additionally, I helped create a community composting program that has now over 200 people signed up. And I have helped divert thousands of pounds of food waste from our residence hall. Additionally, I have created a student agriculture program that educates students on sustainable agriculture and food systems. Currently, I am working to help UWM 
complete their water stewardship verification program through the local water council. And this entails me identifying all of UWM's water related risks and creating strategies on how to mitigate them. I would like to conclude by simply noting that the work that I've done in the Office of Sustainability touches on only a few of the many initiatives that we work on. You can see on the slide there the many things that we work on as an office, and we do everything from working on renewable energy strategies to internally hauling and debagging, sorting our own recycling on campus. I work with a bunch of very passionate and dedicated individuals who are incredible and work every day to make sure that we are pushing sustainability on our campus and in our city, and they are helping to make my campus and the city of Milwaukee a better place. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Grace Lopez Johnson, and I'm the Director of Sustainability for UW Lacrosse's Student Association. I started my freshman year in 2020, right in the midst of the COVID pandemic. As many of you probably experienced, it was really difficult to feel inspired or any sense of community. At the beginning of my second semester, I was seriously considering dropping out. I had struggled to complete online classes. I wasn't really sure what I was there for. I just didn't really feel like I had a sense there. In somewhat of a last ditch effort to find a reason to continue in school, I attended a Students for Sustainability meeting that my friend had brought me to. At the end of the meeting, the chair made a brief comment about how their sustainability director had unexpectedly dropped the position in a brief, um, and made a brief comment about how anyone that wanted to apply should. So I thought to myself, I'll just apply and see what happens, fully expecting the position to go to somebody else with more experience and more connections. While I've always been interested in sustainability and protecting the earth, I didn't really feel like a real change was ever going to be possible. Well, that's not exactly what, how it turned out. So I didn't, um, I didn't think that they were going to offer the name of the position, but then they did, and I was sworn in the next week. I was thrown into a brand new scene with brand new people and a brand new title that I had to find some way to honor. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I was a part of something greater than myself. For the first time in a long time, I felt like I had worth. Being involved in sustainability on campus has completely changed my life in every sense. I've met and worked with some of the most amazing, passionate people in this position, and I'm forever grateful to all those who have inspired me to keep on keeping on in this sometimes uphill battle. I feel so lucky to have expanded my worldview by being challenged and working through these difficult issues that can, as you all know, come with sustainability-related initiatives. I found that it was possible to tie my passion, work for, my passion for policy work to environmentalism and that people could actually make a career out of it. Who knew you could make money doing something that you love? Helping other students feel inspired by sustainability has been by far my greatest accomplishment in my years of doing this. I've found that few, few things connect people like the passion to protect our planet. And if I've learned anything from my time here, I'm a senior now, it's that my voice and all of ours has power. It only takes one person to inspire a movement to become the change that once seemed very impossible. Becoming involved in sustainability has not only kept me motivated to stay in school, but it's motivated me to keep fighting to fight for myself, to fight for those who can't, and to fight for a cleaner and healthier earth because it's worth it. And with your support, it's possible. Thank you. All right, is this on? We're all good? Okay, perfect. Uh, well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Kleinschmidt. I am a senior at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and I co-chair the Green Fund Committee. And I am here today to highlight how student-led initiatives are combating food insecurity at UW Oshkosh. Uh, so in short, food insecurity, we can start slides, sorry. Here we go, okay. In short, food insecurity is the condition of having inadequate access to um, high quality uh, nutritious foods. Uh, research shows that approximately 36% of college students are facing food or some degree of food insecurity. And at UW Oshkosh specifically, that number is reported for one in three. So feelings of food insecurity at UW Oshkosh are exasperated by the fact that we are located in the midst of an urban food desert, uh, which the US Department of Agriculture defines as basically an area that has, um, where people live more than one mile away from a supermarket. 
So Green Fund is a student-run committee that's responsible for allocating funds towards students-led uh, sustainability-minded projects and initiatives on campus. Uh, we operate on a budget of about forty dollars to $60,000 per year that we get from our student segregated fees. Several UW Oshkosh students have actually utilized the Green Fund to implement projects to promote uh, food security on campus. So in the upcoming slides, I'm going to go ahead and discuss two projects that um, have been funded that provide free food to the campus body. So the first project is, uh, involved the planting of edible landscaping uh, in multiple areas around campus, and it was approved in 2018. Uh, individuals from the campus community uh, and actually beyond are welcome to come around campus and pick their own produce for the low, low cost of mild physical labor. <laughs> the second project I wanna focus on is the uh, campus, food, campus food pantry, the cabinet. Uh, in 2022, the Green Fund allocated $10,000 towards the cabinet to ensure that they uh, would have the resources necessary to continue providing for our student body. So the cabinet, which was created by students and for students, has been in operation since February of 2020. Uh, since fiscal year of 21, there have actually been more than 3,500 visits to the pantry by over 1,200 unique students for a distribution of 25,000 pounds of food. Uh, through their services, the cabinet has done more than just fill student stomachs, but they've promoted improved mental health, physical health, academic performance, and social equity. Joy Evans carried out a study that found that food insecurity rates were the highest on campus, uh, amongst on-campus residents, and that all in food food insecure students experienced at least three factors um, that made them more prone to chronic illness. Um, and of the most prominent factors, anxiety was felt uh, the most by 72% of those participants. Additionally, her study showed that students of color are disproportionately experiencing food insecurity uh, with 1,000 or 100%, excuse me, of the African-American identifying participants that uh, also identified as food insecure. So through her work with the cabinet, Joy hoped to not only combat hunger, which can undermine a student's ability to learn and to complete their degree, but to break the stigma around asking for help. The continued high utilization of the cabinet goes to show that Joy's efforts weren't in vain. People are asking for help and they're receiving it graciously. Other campuses experiencing food insecurity issues could benefit greatly from the adoption of a campus food pantry and by following the exemplary lead of our now alumni, Joy Evans. Thank you for your time. Hi there, thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today. My name is Sierra Roski. I'm a senior public health major at UWEC. I'll be attending UWEC next fall for the brand new Master's in Public Health program with an emphasis on rural health. After that, I'll attend the Medical College of Wisconsin to pursue my PhD in population health. And I wanted to talk to you today about sustainability on the UWEC campus and how the ripple effects have positively impacted the community. So I returned from active duty army in the summer of 2022 and I was excited to register for fall classes, but I had a problem. I was one credit short of a full-time status. As you might know, I needed a full-time status to utilize my Wisconsin GI Bill. So I did what a lot of college students do, and I just browsed the one credit offering, not really excited to see what I could find. Nothing really stood out to me. That is, until I got an email from a professor, Jim Bolter, for a one credit class called Building Sustainability in the Academy. The class met once a week for an hour, so I said, why not? This class followed the construction of the county materials complex. You may have heard of this building. The County Materials Complex is an event facility, a field house, a fitness center, and home to the Mayo Clinic Health System Sports Medicine Clinic. The building will be the first on campus to be LEED certified. And this one credit class helped spark my passion for sustainability and my desire to impact public health. It's not just me who's benefited from the UWEC sustainability's focus. Students are using their education and these classes in amazing ways. They are our campus ambassadors, writing sustainability into Senate bills and resolution. They are philanthropists, going into the world with the welfare of others in their heart. And they are our future politicians, ready to make changes. All of this from a one credit class. Students are exposed to hands-on research in our campus. Pictured here is our campus hydroponics. 
Students are growing produce to give to the Campus Harvest Food Pantry. The Campus Harvest Food Pantry has served over 800 students in this semester alone. The pantry is funded entirely by donations, and the pantry needs roughly $4,000 a month to continue to serve students. Sustainability is helping students overcome food insecurity. Now that's what I call an amazing feat. And this is just a fraction of the story that is taking place in our little corner of Wisconsin. Sustainability is growing. When I was attending high school in the late 2000s, and yes, I just aged myself there, sustainability was a buzzword that really didn't mean much. Conversations like this weren't happening in rooms like this. A job in sustainability just wasn't possible. Yet, I've just told you stories about students who are using sustainability as cornerstones in their careers. I've told you how sustainability is impacting food access on our campus. These are just the stories that I know. I guarantee you that there are even more students at the UW Systems Colleges going into the communities and positively impacting those around them. Thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful day. And with that, I yield. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ben Hurley. I'm a member of the Student Ops of Sustainability at UW Eau Claire. Um, I've been, I'm a senior and I've been looking at this for basically the entirety of my college career. And what I've kind of discovered is we've, we're doing, we're doing decently, but we could do a lot better, both at um, promoting sustainability initiatives and at telling people about them. Um, when I came to UW Eau Claire, I didn't really know anything about um, how sustainable it was. Um, and out of the students that I talked to, everyone said that they valued sustainability, but nobody said they knew what was going on with it. Um, the um, general consensus being everyone would really like to see more sustainability. Um, emphasis on see it. Um, and another, another notable concern that many people had was divestment. I'm aware that the board can't do all that much about it, um, but I feel the need to call attention to the UW system's investment in corrupt companies like Black Rocks, um, fossil fuel companies that are destroying the planet and the genocidal apartheid regime of Israel. Um, but again, that is less the board's prerogative than what I primarily want to talk about, which is energy independence. Um, the idea of a fully, um, fully independent, fully sustainable, um, fully resilient campus is one that would have made me apply to any school that had it. Um, that creates a vision of a campus in a student's mind, I think, one that you can put on a brochure. Um, the idea of it as a community that leads by example um, in sustainability. I'm aware that there are solar projects already ongoing, and I think that's, that's the future, whether it's on campus or off campus solar. Um, I think that the idea of an ener fully energy independent campuses is key to a sustainable and appealing UW system for everyone. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Lou. I am a, a student worker at the UW Stevens Point Office of Sustainability where I organize a free thrift store that provides students with clothing, school supplies, and home goods. Keeping resources out of the landfill and giving students free necessities, that is my job. Um, I provide retail therapy to the stressed students who are paying rent for the first time, paying tuition, not sleeping, you know, the grind. But I'm not here to brag about my really cool free store, even though it is taking up an entire floor of a building. And I was just told by the chancellor's office that I have to stop taking up rooms because I'm taking away from office spaces for other programs. Um, it's really no big deal. Um, I am here though, to talk about some things that I'm interested in exploring with the universities of Wisconsin. 
But actually first, let me commend the positive changes that are taking place on our sister campuses. Um, it's essential to celebrate our victories because sometimes it feels like there aren't that many. Um, I remember vividly the last time I came to a Board of Regents meeting. It was at the UW Stevens Point campus um, and it was about sustainability. And one of my friends spoke and it was a really amazing opportunity to hear student voices from across the UW system or universities of Wisconsin. And um, from that meeting, I really felt as though you were hearing student voices and um, you were listening to us. And now we have two paid positions dedicated to sustainability organizing. Shout out Liz and Hayden. Very exciting. And these are wins and these are very exciting things, but it's not enough. Um, and that's really like the other thing that I want to address. Um, these are steps in the right direction. Uh, we have to keep pushing forward and the urgency of the climate crisis demands that we do more. It requires us to be bold, uh, intentional and active in our commitment to a sustainable future. Um, I am a student with many hats, one of which is bright orange, which is the divestment color um, for student uh, organizing divestment campaigns. Um, the students in the audience who share this hat um, are in support of a divestment from fossil fuels, which we have heard that the Board of Regents uh, does not have legal authority to uh, affect the WFAA's mind. Um, I do believe that you have a lot of influence, but uh, that is your choice, I suppose. Um, I think I can speak for many of our students when I say that the current uh, contract between the UW, the Universities of Wisconsin and the Bureau of Correctional Enterprises prison labor um, is not cool. Uh, the state's rollback of EDI policies kind of sucks. Um, and our current non-transparent investments as a system in unethical funds are all reminders that we have more work to do. Not all these things lie on you. Um, a lot of these are lying on student activists who are unpaid and um, skipping classes, uh, calling our Dean of Students and saying, please let me get out of this exam um, to be here today and to be to similar meetings at other times. Um, I've been organizing in favor of fossil fuel divestment for four years now, and still no commitments have been made. We are working on it. Um, I, uh, I know you as a board have limited control um, over endowment investments, but I am under the impression that you have control over the UW Trust Fund which is investing um, using BlackRock, which is contributing to um, the genocide happening in Palestine right now. Um, my friends and I are actually going to the gala rally tomorrow at the Capitol. Um, so uh, it would mean the world to us if you all um, aligned closer with our values, not supporting the beginnings of a genocide. Um, I've also noticed that there is no sustainability committee uh, with the Board of Regents, but um, I think that our position, our sustainability coordinator positions is definitely a good step. Um, also, man, don't make Christina cry. Like, I adore you and I adore this entire panel. These are the student leaders. Um, and I think, um, I think you should be listening more, like we are the future investors in you guys. We're the future donations and future alumni. Um, if you want our future enthusiastic donations and proud appearances at homecomings and fundraisers, um, you need to give us a reason to be proud. And investing in BlackRock and investing in fossil fuel companies, that's not making me proud. Um, your actions today are shaping our decisions to support the institution in the future. And with that, thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes. We can take some questions or comments from Regents. Regent Cruiser. I just, uh, it does my heart good to see young people taking strong stands and opinions and um, getting involved with the future that will help all of us as, uh, in, in the future and then our children and grandchildren. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort to do what you're doing. Uh, some of you working with 
food scarcity, making sure every bit is used, growing food, harvesting food, um, literally work in the fields. And uh, I think it's very commendable. And uh, you're a good role model for all ages in our state. And I wanna thank you for how well prepared you were today and the actions you're taking. Thank you, Regent Cruz. The reason walks. Yeah, I want to echo those remarks. And, and uh, you know, the sustainability issues are so very important for this for this planet. And I'm very proud of UWO Clay, the way they're using ground thermal heat for the for the new field house. Um, but I, I feel very good about the future when I hear you folks talk. It makes me feel like we, we have a, a very good future in this country and that people are understanding the importance of the environment, sustainability, and feeding people. So thank you very much. Regent many deeds. Thank you. So I was at the first meeting and I heard. Excuse me, Regent many deeds. Could you use the microphone, please? I love thank this you. stuff. <laughs> so I was at Stevens Point and I heard the first presentation and I was very happy that we did it. Uh, the earth's dying and it's up to us to help save it. And you're doing that, so thank you. But don't think that we also don't feel that because I have children and grandchildren and I think about and worry about that every day. So to know that you are doing this, that you're sacrificing for the good of everyone, thank you very much. Jim Bogus. I want to thank all of you for being so brave and coming to speak before us. It's it's was a wonderful presentation. I'm just curious, and I apologize. I wasn't sure which student was talking about food waste in the cafeteria. And the regions know and understand the food insecurity on all campuses. Um, and frankly, it's, it's appalling, um, a country that has so much wealth with food. I was just curious if other campuses are and is it just student run that is using the food waste from the cafeteria to help feed students? Anybody else wants to speak about it? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, I'm one of the co-presidents of the Madison chapter of the Food Recovery Network. Um, on our campus, yes, it is just students who are doing that work. Um, our goals right now are to expand that into the university administration structure and institutionalize food recovery. Um, I know that some of our unions um, do back of house composting, things like that, but our goal is to really provide that excess food back to the students who need it. Um, so to answer your question, yes, it is mostly students, but we're working on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Regent Jones. I just wanna thank all of you for being here. And I mean, all of you, everyone uh, at the table and everybody in the background. Um, and thank you for what you do, really. Um, and the passion that you exude is really palpable. And you have to realize the impact that has on us um, and how important that is to us to hear you talk about these issues. Um, and, and, and there is something to power in numbers, right? And so this has got to be a record student turnout for uh, a board meeting. It really is. I mean, it's very remarkable. And, and, and if you think that doesn't go noticed, you're wrong. We feel that. We see it. Um, and going forward, what, I, what, what I'd like to do is encourage you to be frank with us, right? Because not everybody is, right? Um, and I assure you, we can take it. Right, we might not always agree and always act on it as quickly as you'd like, but we can take it. So thank you. Remember to be frank with us. Thank you. Uh, yes, Regent Brink. Hello, uh, thank you all for speaking today. It's really great to see uh, a bunch of students here uh, in front of us. As a current student, it's really cool to see all the different universities coming together for this meeting and talking about such an important issue. So I really want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for a very educational and impressive presentation. I'll just echo my fellow regents that your passion and your commitment to time and effort and carrying things forward 
those things sink in. They definitely do. So keep up the good work. We'll try to be right there by your side as much as we can. Thank you. All right, do regents have any communications, petitions or memorials to share, Regent Tyler? Uh, I would just like to congratulate uh, UW Eau Claire on their certification as a family friendly workplace. Um, Chancellor Schmidt uh, was quoted as saying, Be being recognized as a family friendly workplace reflects our co uh, collective commitment to well being of our faculty, staff, and students. We value deeply our colleagues and will continue to work to seek opportunities to create a positive environment at UW Eau Claire for them and their families. And I just, um, I, uh, the experience in going through what they did was was very strong. And I, it, it, I think sometimes we forget how strong our universities are as employers within the communities. Um, and this is just a, an indication of the strength of the benefits and policies that they have. And just wanted to add my congratulations to Eau Claire. Excellent, I believe we can all get on board with that. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, that concludes our meeting. Um, happy New Year, happy holidays, however you celebrate. We'll see you in February. Well, you know.